Hello everybody, welcome to the Cincy Junior Sabbath School Show. My name is Daisy and we're on lesson 12 for both PowerPoint and Cornerstone lessons. Before we start, if you don't have the lesson book, you can get it at www.juniorpowerpoint.org or cornerstoneconnections.net. I hope you can go check it out. The title for the PowerPoint lesson is Victory and Defeat. The key text can be found from 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57 and it reads, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The power text is victory is a gift from God, not a product of our strength. Also, the title for the cornerstone lesson is cleaning up. The key text can be found from da Daniel 8 verse 14. And it reads there. And he said to me for 2300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleaned. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you can stay tuned for the for the PowerPoint and Cornerstone lessons. God bless you. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Sensi Junior Cyber School live show. My name is Happy. My name is Rhonda. My name is William Popoda. And that is our special guest. Thank you for joining us today. Um, before we continue with our show, we're gonna start our show with the, a prayer for God. So Rhonda, can you please give us an opening prayer? Yes, may we bow our heads and pray. God, we pray that you help us understand this lesson that we're about to learn in um, both um, PowerPoint and Cornerstone. We pray that everything that we learn, we should use it and apply it to us, and we should also have a uh, simple and determined understanding of what we're going to learn. In Jesus' name, I have prayed. Amen. Amen. So uh, we do have people that do stream our shows. Hope Channel over at TV and also CB Radio streams our shows. It's repeated on Hope TV Ghana. Sunday is at 12 p.m., Tuesday is at 3 p.m., every Monday, 7 o'clock p.m. EST for CB Radio Ghana, and also on Obra TV is every Monday to Friday. So today we are on Lesson 12, and the title for the PowerPoint is Victory and Defeat, and the power text is found from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. So Ariel, if you're there, can you please give us a summary of the PowerPoint lesson? I'm Ariel Sakodia. I'm 11 years old, and I'm from Philadelphia, SDA, Ghana, Ghana Church. So, the lesson was about how Samson was in jail after his enemies had cut his hair. So he was thinking about how he was. Um, God gave him strength, and he pushed the two gates. But now he was just sitting there, getting a little red rest ever since the Philistines had learned of how to bow to God. It has shaped his head. He has been blindly grinding grain in a prison Gaza. He was his capture was a huge Philistine. This celebration would honor the god dragon. He could sense that people, as usual, were crowding into the temple for festivals. Samson remembered when God had blessed him with great physical strength. Samson knew that he started making bad choices. In his choices of friends and entertainment, he went against the wishes. He went against the wishes of his parents, who pleaded him, pleaded with him. Slowly, these choices have become more important to him than the work God was doing through him. Before he knew it, he was here, blind and helpless, a slave to his enemies. And since that he been since they've been able to capture him, the Philippines were were convinced that their God was more powerful than his. Samson was sad and he was think of he was thinking about what he had done. So a lot of people have um a lot of visit visitors attended the festival in the city of Gaza. Sam Samson finished feeling sorry for himself. He knew that he brought trouble upon himself. Now he felt sorry for the mockery he was hearing around him, mockery of God who had chosen him and made him strong in the first place. 
the God who asked him to destroy the Philistines. Samson sensed that Samson sensed Samson sensed that God heard the silence of prayer of helpless. Dear God, you made me strong. I thought I could do whatever I wanted. I would I thought I was strong, but I could but I cannot defeat the Philistines because I misused the strength you gave me. They have defeated me. Please, God, use my weak and broken body one more time. Win the last victory to show that you are God. You are God. I will gladly die. I will gladly die with the enemy. Samson could feel God's presence with him. He knew that he was still loved. That he was forgiven. Now through now through Samson's weakness, God will prove his strength and, and help him. Samson called out the boy who had been assigned to lead him from the prison to the temple. The boy led the shuffling Samson. Samson, where he could lean evenly against two players, pillars. He closed his eyes and prayed again. Then he pushed with all his might. Slowly, the huge pillars began to crumble. The entire, the entire temple shook as the walls collapsed. All the people on the roof and the roof itself caved in, in on the rest of the people below. Rulers and people alike, along with Samson, were buried in the crumbling ruin. Once again, God had won the victory in spite of the bad choices Samson had made. God had never stopped loving him. And when he had stood powerful and humbly asked God for the victory, God had, God had once again won. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your summary of the PowerPoint lesson. So we're going to head into our discussion, having Rianda and also Pastor join us in answering the questions. So Aria, the first question is, what is your understanding of the PowerPoint? The PowerPoint is victory is a gift from God, not a product of our strength. I think it means that we cannot do things by ourselves and we need God to win victory. My belief is that we can't do any things without God. Like that, like in the Bible, it says all things are done through Christ. Mm -hmm. And then, Pastor, what is your understanding of the PowerPoint, which says victory is a gift from God, not a product of our own strength? Yes, yeah, so God will give us gifts and talents. Those gifts are to be used in the service of God. So if we tend to think that I have this ability, and if I use this, I will gain the victory myself, we are mistaken. We see from the story of Samson, he thought he had the power, he could do whatever he wanted to do. And we saw he lost everything, but God we, uh, gave him the power again. So victory comes from God. And all the abilities we have is something God has given to us. Thank you guys for your answers. Um, the next question is, why did the spirit of the Lord give Samson so much strength to fight against the Philistines? Yeah, Ariel, you can go. Because in the, in the story, God still loved and forgave him, so God gave him another chance and had a plan for him. The reason why God had did that is because he believed that Samson truly really deserved another chance because he showed signs of repentance. So God wanted to make sure that Samson would have another chance in life instead of getting crushed by the Philippines. And then, Pastor, what's your answer to the question? Yes, I'll take it into two parts. The first part, I'll take it to the last part, when he prayed and God gave him that victory. You could see uh, the, a battle ongoing. We could see a battle between the power and God and that of the gods of the Philistine. They were chanting, believing their God was great, was superior. So God, after Samson repented of his sin, showed to the whole world that, of course, he holds all power. God has all the power and authority. So that was to show and prove the power of God. There is no power that comes beside the power of God. And I've taken it also from another leg. The second leg I'm taking it from, as you can see from the story, God brought in something with a sole purpose to deliver his children from the uh, Philistines. They were under them, they were in captivity under the Philistines. Though where they, they were staying in their own country, God wanted to deliver his people and he used Samson. And Samson thought he would do it his own way. So looking at the bigger picture, the bigger picture was God delivering his children 
from the hostility of the Philistines. So in that final leg, we saw God gave them that great power again to show his authority so that what God said also will come to pass. That was to deliver his children from the Philistines. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, next question is, how do we find negative thoughts in our mind? We can pray. We can pray and talk to God about it. Instead of directly taking matters into our own hands, I feel like it would be good to at least tell God about it and then go tell an adult if you want to go tell an adult. Mm -hmm. And then, lastly, Pastor, how do we fight negative thoughts in our mind? Yeah. So, looking at the context of that of, uh, of Samson, he was having this negative thought believing that he cannot do it he has done wrong and stuff but one important line in the lesson is he felt that god heard him and that gave us a clue in how we could fight negative thoughts we may we, we may have made mistakes thinking that god is far away from us but the thing and the lesson we could learn from something as we acknowledge them, that god is with us god has never left us and we need to go back to god but if we feel God is far away from us. We are mistaken. He does not leave us. He's a God who is eager to embrace us. He's a God who is eager to bring us back to, our fold, back to his fold. So if we feel or we sense this negative thought, believing, oh, I'm far away from God, feel suicidal, thinking I'm there alone, let's realize that God is still closer to us. If we will go to him, he's ever ready to embrace us. So it's for us to recognize God is there with us. He's still with us so we can go to him. And in so doing, we could fight it, realizing that the ultimate God is ever ready to forgive us and accept us back. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And our last question for the PowerPoint discussion is, do you believe God answers prayers? Why or why not? Yes, I believe he answers prayers because when Simon asked God to give him the strength to win against his enemies, he answered. And when my mom got sick, we prayed for her and she was healed. Mm -hmm. I believe God answers prayers because it was, a, it was the morning of my pre-ACT. I had like a little, I little, I kind of blanked out a couple minutes into the ACT and I asked God for help because I didn't want to get a bad score. And then God had helped me and gave me an 18, at least on my ACT. That's good. And then lastly, yes. Pastor, do you uh, believe God answers prayers? God answers our prayers. We could see many examples in the Bible. God himself telling us to come, come with our burdens. He's ever ready to help us. He tells us in Isaiah 1, 8, that we should come and let us reason together. At times, some feel God does not answer prayer if, they, if things do not go the way they want it. The point we should note is God uh, knows a lot than we do. He has a lot of ways. So if we are not getting answers the way we want, it does not mean that God does not answer our prayers. He answers our prayers, but he knows what is best for us. And he answers our prayers in his own time. So prayer, let me put it in the context. Prayer is a communication with God. We talking to God and God responds to our prayers. And the response that God gives to our prayers, it's so, it's so calm that it comes the way we want it. But God knows if I answer this child of mine in this way, he will enjoy, but he will not enjoy to the fullest. So let me do it this way rather for my child and also help him build faith. So the point is God answers. I have a lot of testimonies in my life. There were times when I felt there is no way. I prayed to God and I felt God answering my prayers. Some have been with exams. Some have been with financial issues. God always comes true. So he listens and hears our prayers. He's a good God who is close to us. And we see that with Samson. He was struggling. And at that deepest time of his life where he felt he's far away from God, God helped him. So he tells us, no matter how far we've gone, God answers prayers and he will hear us. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor, for your answer. And also thank you to Rayonda and Ariel for helping us answer the PowerPoint questions. So uh, before we move on, we do have a comment from Lady Smart. She said, Amen, Ariel. And then also here's a reminder to keep help sharing our videos so we can help spread the word of God. So now we're going to head into our cornerstone part. We're also on Lesson 12 for the Cornerstone, and the title is Cleaning Up. 
The key text is found from Daniel chapter 8, verses 14. So Rondo, give us a summary of the cornerstone lesson. Okay, so in the in our lesson twelve cleaning up, it was about this. It was about a tent. It's like a copy and paste of the actual heaven, and Christ wanted to give something else that he could offer to the tent. He was thinking about doing bulls and cattle, but he did not do that. He decided to give himself up so that he could use his blood to clear us from guilty consciousness and our sins. That's why if you were to baptize, you are cleared from all your sins and you can continue living in the world, living in the world of God so that you have, um, you don't have any bad reason that you would die. So then God, he had given himself up and decided to use his, his own blood to clean us. That's why uh, that's why there's something called baptism. It's like being born again. But instead, he decided to clean us with his own blood, which caused us to become sinless. Thank you so much, Rihanna, for your summary of the Cornerstone lesson. So now we're going to have Ariane also pass to join us in the Cornerstone discussion. So, Rihanna, what does it mean to be free from sin? What means to be free from sin is that you have been cleaned. You don't want to do sin again. So then you have your ways of not um, doing things that are not fit in Christ's, um, fit in Christ's face. Mm -hmm. Ariel, what does it mean to be free from sin? I think it means you are set free from sin, meaning that you won against and defeated the devil that makes you worship bad things. And once you start focusing on God, the devil will start realizing that his plans are not working and he would leave you alone. And then Pastor, what do you think it means to be free from sin? To be free from sin, one is to be free from the condemnation that comes with sin. You know, the wages of sin is dead. And that is what we find in the Bible, is something, a theme that's near to Jewish scripture. When you sin, you are to die. So it brings also a burden on you. It's like carrying a bigger load on you and your crushing. So to be free from sin is, is for you to be set free. It's for you to be free from that condemnation. You are no longer being accused that you, you, you are a sinner. You've done this. So it comes with free conscience. It comes with true and genuine happiness. And it comes also into we, I mean, back into communication with God. Let's note what sin brought about. After our first parents, Adam and Eve have sinned, there was a big gap between God and, 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 and humanity. There was this big gap. So to be free from sin is for us to come back into communion with God. Jesus came into the picture to bridge that gap, uh, that, uh, gap that came in between us and God. So it set us free for us to commune with that king of kings and also be accepted back as children of God. So that is what it means to be free of sin. One, free of its condemnation. One, access also into the throne room of God. Thank you so much. Um, so in the story, the Cornerstone lesson, it does mention the word blood. So why is blood important in this story? The reason why blood is important in this story is because um, Christ's blood was clean. He had no sin in him. So he also wants us to be like him. We shouldn't commit sins and do bad things so that we can also have clear blood like him. Mm -hmm. yeah, Ariel? I think it's a, it is important because in the story it says that Christ went well once and for all into the most holy place and freed us from sin forever. He did this by offering his own blood instead of blood of goats and bulls. According to the law of Moses, those people who become unclean are not to fit to worship God, yet they are considered clean if they are sprinkled with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of of a sacrifice calf, but Christ was sinless and offered himself as an eternal and spiritual sacrifice to God. That's why his blood is much more powerful and makes our consequences clear. And Pastor? Yeah, we got it from the lesson that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. 
So without the shedding of blood, no forgiveness of sin. And we see that also through scripture. And that's why uh, God gave uh, Moses that type, that uh, type or a copy of the anti-type, the original to follow. Because when one dies, that person ought to die. When one sins, that person ought to die. And that's where we get the shedding of blood. You sin, you ought to die. So in the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, when one sin, he brings in a lamb, a goat, and stuff, and transfer a sin onto the animal for, the, uh, for that animal to be killed. So they get the blood, and the priest takes it to the holy place, and he sprinkles the blood into the altar of incense and also on the tent, showing that the sin of that individual first was transferred to the uh, animal and later to the sanctuary. So that there is a need for a shedding of blood. And Jesus came in into the picture. He did not sin. He had no sin, but he took upon himself our sins. So all our sins then went to Jesus. And as I said, the wages of sin is there. If you sin, you ought to die. So there is a need of shedding of blood because without it, there is no forgiveness. And Jesus, without sin, took on our sins, everything, and he died in our stead. So in Jesus shedding his blood, it tells us we have forgiveness. We have access back into the throne room of God. So when I sin now, I need not to get an animal and transfer my sin onto that animal so that there will be shedding of blood. That shedding of blood was done by Jesus. His blood is enough to save us, to cleanse us from our sins. So to come back to your question, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Thank you so much for your guys' answers. And the last question for the cornerstone part is, what is something we can take from this story? Something that you can take from this story is um, how God had acted in the story. He didn't even think twice about giving himself up for some for us. He didn't think twice about giving up his blood to save the people that were coming after he created them. So I think that we, we shouldn't, um, when you're helping someone, you shouldn't hesitate to help somebody. You should just help someone instead of thinking, oh, what if they do this, what if they do that? It's good to think of the good other than the bad. Thank you. And then Ariel, what is something we could take from this story? What I took from the story was that Christ died to rescue those who had sinned and broken the old agreement. Now he brings his chosen ones a new agreement with his guarantees of God's eternal blessing. And then lastly, Pastor. Amen. So my lesson from that is God wants to have fellowship with us. God wants to for us to come back to himself and have communication with him. He wants to save us. That's what God wants to do. So we see, we saw from the sacrificial system, God's plan of still being with his children, with what Christ came to do for us. He becomes our perfect sacrifice. With Jesus Christ, we have the hope and assurances that our sins are forgiven us. That is a source of hope with what Christ came to die for us. Christ came to do for us. And he did not just shed his blood for us. He's now serving as the high priest. We saw from the lesson that yearly, the day of atonement, what we refer to as Yom Kippur, the high priest goes into the most holy place to intercede. Uh, that was a day of judgment. And he intercedes on behalf of God's people. Now Christ is interceding on our behalf. We have a high priest who understands us. He understands what uh, our sins are struggles. Now we could go to God and plead and we have him interceding for us. That is a source of hope. That should encourage us to, to go to him, go to Christ. Don't hold on to your sin. If you're struggling, don't hold on to it. Go to Jesus. He's interceding for you. He understands your feelings. He understands your struggle. And he's ever ready to redeem us and deliver us. That is a good news. And that's what we refer to as the gospel. Everything in that points to Jesus. What he came to do for us and what he's still doing for us. And he will come again and take us home where there will be no more sorrow, no more death. Where we will be with him forever and ever. And that is the good news. Amen. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for the three of you guys helping us answer the cornerstone lesson. So before we end our show, Pastor, I know the last question was kind of similar to what I'm about to ask you now, but could you give us like a moral lesson that you got from like the PowerPoint and cornerstone lessons combined? So for the uh, PowerPoint lesson, 
my main lesson is our choices. We should be careful. God created us as free beings. We are there with choices. Samson made wrong choices, and we saw what happened to him, but he still went back to God. We should allow God to help us in our choices, in deciding what to do. As we're growing up, as we want to make it in life, we need God's direction so we could make the right choice. Samson had a good future. Though he was able to accomplish his task, but he died with the Philistines. It would not have happened if he had followed the, uh, the, the, the templates God has given him or what God wanted him to do. So we should be careful in our choices and allow God to lead us. The second uh, lesson that I got from the PowerPoint is that Jesus' blood is enough. We need to go to Christ when we, when, when we sin. When we falter, let's go to Jesus Christ. You cannot, mm-hmm. uh, you cannot do it yourself. Sin is a condition. There's something which is with us, but the solution is Jesus Christ. So the moral lesson is: go to Christ, no matter what. Go to Jesus because God does not give up on us. Whenever you feel bad and you feel God is not with you, that is the time He's so close to you. Go to Him and He'll forgive you your sins. Thank you so much, Pastor, for the moral lesson that you got from the PowerPoint and the Cornerstone Lessons combined. To end our show, can you please give us a closing prayer? Let's pray. Our Lord and King, creator of the universe, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving us Jesus. We thank you for Jesus dying a shameful death in order to save us. That faithful Friday, he was naked in order to save us. And his blood is now for us. We thank you, Father Lord. We dedicate our whole self to you. We pray you, God, that you continue to lead us. Teach us the way we should go. You've promised us in Psalm 32, verse 8, that you will guide us with your eye. We pray you, God, that you continue to guide us, continue to lead us, and bless us. We pray, committing everyone watching and listening to us, that you bless that person to know you, God, whom to know is life eternal. We thank you, Lord, for an answered prayer because we've asked through the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much to our viewers who continue to watch our videos every Saturday. Don't forget, we do stream every Saturday, 2.30 p.m. EST. You can find us on all social media platforms at Cincinnati Ghanaian SDA Church page. Hope to catch you guys all next week for Lesson 13. Bye.